Hello, AP Calc BC students, Mr. Rector from Iman, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at our example three from topic 1015. I want to give you a little heads up. The next two examples are going to cover the binomial series, which is very, very, very likely not going to be tested on the BC exam. I do want to spend some time talking about this with my students because the binomial series is such an important part of mathematics. When you're talking about, say, x plus 2 to the fifth power, how that can certainly be expanded without using power series. But if we talk about x plus 2 raised to some fractional exponent, then things get a little bit rough. And that becomes sometimes a difficult series to, to work with accordingly. And so that's the kind of focus that I want to put on this particular lesson. So it's still a part of our curriculum at Avon High School, but you're not going to see this on the BC exam very likely. So what do we got going on here? Well, as I said, it's just one more type of elementary function that we have yet to discuss in class. 1 plus x raised to some k power. That is what we refer to as the basic binomial series. And while it's not going to be up here on the exam, it's got some very neat ramifications through mathematics. So let's go ahead and take a look at this example. You are asked to find the Maclaurin series for 1 plus x to the k and determine the radius of convergence. And we're going to assume that k is not, not a positive integer because after all, would we really need calculus, right, to take x plus 1 to the fifth power? We could just expand that out. Now, if we use the binomial series that we're about to develop, it's going to give us the same result. But we would probably do this more likely for cases of k that are a little bit trickier, like the fractional values. So how do we start? Well, we're going to start the way that we always start. We're going to begin by taking uh, our value or our function f, and we're just going to take several derivatives of this f of x until we kind of develop a pattern or get tired of it, whichever one comes first. So if we take our first derivative. You can see that we get k out in front times 1 plus x to the k minus 1. And we keep that going for f double prime. We're going to get k out in front times a k minus 1 times 1 plus x to the k minus 2 power. Now, I, I know that we can keep doing this. I'm going to think that we're not going to need to keep doing this. I'm going to think that we're all wise to the fact that we've been doing this long enough that we can probably see patterns develop. So if we get to the nth derivative, notice what's happening. We're going to continue to have this k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 times, well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, continuing until we get to k minus something. And that something that's going to go right here, if we look up above, is one less than the derivative that we're taking. Notice here, this was a 1, and our derivative was a second power. Up here, you can see k minus 0 is one less than the first derivative. All right? So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have something subtracting from k that's one less than our n. And that would just be k minus the quantity n minus 1. And so that's where we would stop that nth derivative. Now, we still have our 1 plus x. That's not going to change. And now we see, hopefully we see, that the, the uh, exponent would be k minus. And up here you could see k minus 2, the 2 sort of corresponds to the derivative that we're taking. So if we continue that, we would have a k minus n. Next, what we become interested in doing is evaluating each one of these at, luckily, at a Maclaurin series. So that would be when x is 0. So f of 0, if we let x be 0, 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 to any power is going to be 1. We do the same thing for f prime letting x be 0, you see that we have k times k, uh, I'm sorry, k times 1 to the k minus 1, which is k times 1, which is just simply k. And then if we take the second derivative, evaluated him at 0, you got k times k minus 1, again, times 1 to some power, which is just going to leave us with a k quantity k minus 1. And if we continue this, 
all the way down to the nth derivative, evaluating at zero, hopefully we can all see that you would have k times k minus 1 times k minus 2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to k minus and n minus 1. In other words, you can probably see that the value um, that we have here in the last term, k minus 1, the 1 is 1 less than the derivative that we've taken. Here, n minus 1 is 1 less than this derivative that we've taken in. Okay, well, what do we do with all this, you might ask? Well, that's a great question. I think we can start to write our series. So f of x would be equal to, and because I'm saying equal to, I want to make sure that down at the end I put dot, dot, dots. And so I'll start with my first term, 1, divide that by 0 factorial, multiply that by x minus 0 to the 0. All of that just becomes a 1 that multiplies by that 1. So nothing new there. And then I'll add k. k would be divided by 1 factorial. Yep. And then multiplied by x minus 0 because it's a Maclaurin. From here on out, I'm just going to say x. And that would be raised to the first power. So there's our first two terms. And uh, notice the problem didn't say how many terms to get. It just wants us to find a series. So we probably have to list a few before we can really get a sense for its uh, sort of its vibe, its look. And so we go to the next term. And that would consist of the coefficient k, k minus 1, all divided by 2 factorial, which I can just say 2. doesn't matter if I write the factorial there. And of course, x would be squared at that point. Next term. Now, I know we don't really have the third derivative term here, but if you see the pattern emerge, hopefully you're all going to be in agreement that you'd have k, k minus 1, k minus 2 on top, all over 3 factorial multiplied by x cubed. If this were to continue forever, you would get to your nth derivative, which we've already talked about. It's going to look something like this. Because we're talking about the nth term, we would have n factorial, or I should say the nth degreed term. We would have an n factorial, and then, of course, multiplied by x to the n. And this is going to keep going in order for us to say that this is equivalent. And so I would say at this point, we've done a pretty good job of developing the series. It's written in open form. It's not in the nice summation form. But to be honest, if you want to make this a summation form, excuse me, all you'd have to do is put a summation right in front of that, and boom, you have it. So I'm not going to write the, the rewrite the problem just to make that happen. But what I am going to do is address the last half of the question, and that is to determine the radius of convergence. And in order to find the radius of convergence, the ROC, or interval of convergence here, what I am going to do is use the ratio test. That was our tried and true go-to test when we were first discussing this, and it's not changed. So I'm going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of the nth plus 1 expression. Now, what is the nth plus 1 expression? Well, that would essentially be taking this expression right here and changing all of the n's to be n plus 1. And so I would have k multiplied by k minus 1 all the way to k minus 2 to k minus 3. And then I would have k minus, and if this is going to be an n plus 1 minus 1, right? I'm changing n to n plus 1. I'm just going to have k minus n factorial as my nth term, or my nth plus 1 there. And so that's where we'll start, k minus n factorial. And then everything else, again, you're just simply going to let the n change to an n plus 1. So it looks like we pretty much have that worked out. All right, now if you remember what the ratio test is saying, is we would divide that by the nth term expression, which is nothing more than just this guy right here. 
Now I am going to, instead of dividing by that, I'm going to multiply by its reciprocal, which essentially puts an n factorial in, in the top. And then the bottom is going to be the k times the k minus 1 all the way down to the k minus n minus 1. And then, of course, we still have an x to the n there. All right, extend that fraction line. And now, hmm, what do you think? Do you suppose that we can reduce this a little bit? Certainly hope so, because this thing is a mess. So we're going to go ahead and reduce. Let's talk about the easy things first. For example, the x to the n plus 1 over x to the n. Pretty easy. That's just going to be an x in the numerator when you subtract those powers. n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. Again, we've seen that many times. That's just going to produce an n plus 1 in the denominator. But I'm more concerned about this k minus n factorial and this k, k minus 1, all the way down to k minus quantity n minus 1. Well, my hope, <laughs> what my hope is, is that we understand that this k minus n factorial is really just the very next term that would be showing up after this. All right? Basically, we're, we're showing that we take k and we subtract 1, we subtract 2, we subtract 3, we subtract 4, we get down to subtracting an n minus 1. Well, the thing that would come after an n minus 1 would likely be an n if we're moving in that same correct direction. All right? Another way to think about it is what would precede the k minus n term up here? Well, you'd have a k, k minus 1, k minus 2, k minus the number just before the n minus, uh, just before the n, which would be an n minus 1, right? We're kind of thinking about the factorial being written like that. So essentially then what will happen is that this entire thing will cancel out that factorial mark and k minus n would be the only term that's left with that cancellation. It's a little tricky because it's it's definitely rooted in some, uh, uh, you know, some symbols that you have to fight through, but uh, hopefully that doesn't bother you too much. So this is what we're looking at taking the limit of as n approaches infinity. Now, remember, if we just isolate n on this particular expression, just the expressions with the n, we see that we could let the limit take hold there where the degree of n is 1 in the top and the bottom, and therefore we can just divide by the coefficients, negative 1 divided by positive 1, the coefficients of n. And so we get an answer of negative 1, but the absolute values are going to turn that into a positive 1, and, and so it turns out that your answer to this is just the absolute value of negative 1 times x, which of course is no, no different than just the absolute value of x, basically, right? Now remember, what has to be true to converge, we know the rules, right? To converge via the ratio test, the absolute value of x must be less than 1, which means that x has to lie between negative 1 and positive 1. And that would serve as our interval of convergence. Now, the question says, hey, you only have to figure out what the radius of convergence is. Well, seeing as how we have 0 in the middle because this is a Maclaurin, and we go out 1 this to the right, we go out 1 to the left, then the radius of convergence would certainly be not 0, but positive 1. And there's a specific reason why I did not ask you to find the interval of convergence. Because in order to find the interval of convergence, you would have to understand what is the behavior at 1 and negative 1. And you're going to find out that that's going to rely very heavily on what k is. We don't know the value of k, and that's going to be a little problematic if we try to plug 1 or negative 1 in for x. Now, if we go back here in time, I'm going to go back several pages in my notes here, some of these Pages might look familiar if you've seen some of the videos, but I want to go back to this table and remind you that at the very bottom, we have the open form for the binomial series, and we also have its general term here, which does indeed coincide with what we did.
But over here to the right, you kind of see what its interval of convergence is, but it has an asterisk by it. And that asterisk is very dependent upon the convergence at plus and minus one depends on the value of k, like I just said. So with that being said, we have now finished this example as I return to it. And we've worked our first binomial series. They're very challenging. I'm not going to lie. That's very likely the reason why they're not on the AP exam. But in our next example, things are going to get kind of interesting because I'm going to physically ask you to find a very specific series for a, a, a 1 plus x that has a fractional exponent, which then makes this a little bit more worth our while as we're going to be able to find something that we'll to. So hope this helps, and we'll see you in the next video.